Welcome geologist, and we're going to talk today about fossils and how they fit into the equation of evolution. And we'll be looking at it from a perspective of historical geology instead of what you learned in physical. So back in physical, you learned the basic identification of phylums and what a fossil is and an index fossil. You learned about recognition of certain types of preservation. Well, we'll relook at some of that today. So we're going to take it a much further step to apply it to this course. Fossils are a huge part of understanding historical geology and placing events properly in the geologic time scale. So you're looking at a fossil here from this year's field course and I'd like you to uh, kind of think about what you might guess that is. And just ponder it for a second. I'll tell you it's a, it's a bone so I'm going to give you that hint. And I'm going to tell you it's Triassic in age. So you're sitting there going, hmm, I've never seen a bone that really looks like that. So think on it for a second, and then I'm going to guide you to hopefully come up with a hypothesis that will work. I would like you to think about crocodiles and alligators. And then I'd like you to think about the bony structures they have on their back, the plates that protect them, that make them armored. That's what you're looking at there, except you're not looking at it from a crocodile or an alligator. You're looking at it from an ancient organism of a phytosaur or an adiosaur. These are animals found at the Tucumcari dig site where field course goes and digs each year at the beginning of our course. So this is a very nice sized specimen and it's pretty much in its bony format. There's been some preservation change and it's certainly found in a uh, siltstone uh, shaley layer and so you're looking at this material and you can see that the bone's fairly fragile. Also point out do you see how there's some stress marks and fractures and that it's been uh, changed in color. Very characteristic for fossils in the fossil record especially vertebrates. So what is a fossil by definition? The term actually means to be dug up. Scientifically, we're looking at any recognizable form of prior life, and you know that a fossil is supposed to be 10,000 years or older. However, we do recognize what are called subfossils. We'll get to them in a little bit. So, why is the 10,000 year marker the magic number? If you get your geologic time scale out, notice that the Holocene starts at 10,000 years. So I'm going to ask you, do you think this animal over here that, uh, this is Gretchen, by the way, she works at the Tucumcari Museum. She's giving a presentation talking about this organism. You would look at it and automatically know that it's more than 10,000 years old because you've grown up with dinosaurs. And that is certainly a type of dinosaur, carnivorous type of dinosaur. So when you look at that, you'll go, hmm, okay, I buy off on that being a fossil. Sometimes fossils aren't grandier and big like this one is right here. Sometimes they're microscopic. In historical geology, they're some of the most important organisms we look at because they give us information about mass extinctions. So fossils you need to be in your brain as being more than just a big megafauna. They can be tiny and microscopic. So what does extant versus extinct mean? You're looking at a marmot from Glacier National Park. I was fortunate enough to see on my sabbatical. That would be an extant species, meaning it's still alive today and it is capable of reproducing. We'll keep coming back to that reproducing theme because an animal can be alive but unable to reproduce. So if it's the last of its pair for reproduction, it doesn't matter. It isn't going to be able to happen. So there is such a thing as extinct in the wild. Uh, that's actually a qualification for the Endangered Species Act, if you didn't know. So an extinct animal is one that has no chance of reproducing. So we usually think of extinct animals as very, very ancient, back in rolling uh, the time back to the Ice Age and further back. Well, uh, again, we can have extinct in the modern day time where animals are going extinct and cannot reproduce except in captivity. So, and on terms of our course, I think we can generally say 
that extinct fossils, and for the most part, are going to be those that start at the Ice Age and work backwards. But I have to be honest, we've had ex uh, animals go extinct in modern time. So I just want to put that in your thought brain because that's going to kind of be part of the theme of this course is looking at these extinction events and understanding uh, what kinds of environmental causes contributed to them. Back in the original early days of geology, scientists had some basic questions that needed to be answered about fossils. First one, are fossils organic remains? In other words, are they remains of ancient living life? So that was the first question that they wanted a definitive scientific proof for. Second, how do these things get into rocks? If they look like animals that are alive today, why are they in rock layers that are uh, inches, feet, and sometimes hundreds of feet beneath our shoes. When did the fossils get there? How do we attribute a time to where these fossils are found in rock strata? That's a really important question because this is at the beginning of where geologic time was starting to be recognized, as we have learned earlier from your first few lectures. And so this is a major component of how we build the geologic time scale. And last but not least, how did the fossils get preserved? Why are they preserved there and not elsewhere? Why don't we find them every single place that we look the same exact fossils? These are reasonable questions of which you can probably come up with some, some answers to. But sometimes the obvious answer is not the only answer and that's what we'll investigate here. So. Fossils in Genesis. We're talking about Genesis and the Bible here. The first fossils that helped give paleontology a jump start was the discovery of excavation of Pompeii. Pompeii was when Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD. This was the famous uh, place where all the cast of humans and animals are found from a pyroclastic flow that buried the city of that time. So humans have been very fascinated with civilizations of other prior humans. Well, in most cases in geology, we don't get into the human history unless you're looking further back than 10,000 years. But we certainly look at the animal record. We'll look at humans a little later in the course. But archaeology is the study of modern uh, hominid uh, remains and hominid uh, artifacts. So when you're thinking ar archaeology and geology, while they're similar, there is a fundamental difference between the two. So this is Axel right here. He is a PhD in paleontology at Mesa Lands Community College. And this is our field course learning about some fossils and their origins and why they're in rock layers in Tucumcari, New Mexico. But why don't we same, find those same fossils here where we live? So an important question to, to ask is how did they get into the rocks in Tucumcari, New Mexico? So this is Tucumcari, New Mexico. This is one of our students digging for fossils right there. And once fossils were initially studied in depth, in other words, they were scrutinized, this presented data that suggested that Genesis might not provide a perfect account of how the Earth was formed. That was kind of a big deal for uh, considering that the church since the Roman Empire had accepted Genesis as literal, as literal truth for real. And uh, this challenged that thought process. This realization didn't come about as a spontaneous instant moment. It took time and it took evolution of thoughts, took long-term study and comparison of fossils between rock layers of different places around the world. I might add that's still going on today. So this science of understanding paleontology is, even though it's been around a while, it's still an evolving science. It's changing with the new fossil discoveries that we uh, find out in the field, which is why field work is so critical to geology, is understanding and getting out and seeing what's there, mapping what's there, recognizing the clues that are in the rock record and not just taking one clue and making a holistic answer you got to take multiple clues to get to that holistic answer to kind of piece together what happened to make that rock layer and the history of that rock layer. So what are some early thoughts about fossils? Well, Leonardo da Vinci is one of the most important 
beginning thoughts about this. In about 1500 AD, he re recognized that fossil shells in northern Italy represented that ancient marine life uh, had been there existing in rock, rock layers that were miles inland from the shoreline. In other words, he found shelly animals like brachiopods or clams like mollusks. And he said, wow, they're, they're so far inland they couldn't have gotten washed up by high tide. So he understood that. He made some key points at that time. Here they are. Clams were fragile and they'd break in a flood. So that's going back to the biblical flood. Number two is clams couldn't travel inland that far in 40 days. What's the magic 40 days? The flood. Okay, so going back to the biblical flood. Ancient rock layers show fossil communities, not just individuals. I think that's an important part to note. We do find uh, assemblages of fossils that show where animals clustered together. In other words, a paleoecological community. Newer layers did not have fossils and others did. So it was interesting to compare that not all rock layers had fossils, but many had rock layers and they were not the same, indicating change. This suggested multiple events made the rock layers. They were not all one, uh, one single flood event that created the rocks that we have that contain fossils. So going back to what we learned about in evolution or geologic time, this was an important thing to note. This is kind of really challenging that the flood created all the sediments that we have on Earth and the mountains are just the original stuff on Earth. Well, the next guy you've recognized a lot in our studies, and that is Nicholas Steno. Steno, uh, in 1669, presented three of the most important fundamental principles or laws that we operate in geology. They're gibneys of geology. These are things that you should have learned in physical, but they need to be revisited with the historical lens. What I mean by a lens is a point of view, and we'll be referring to that term regularly this semester. His writings were better circulated than uh, da Vinci, so his work had an immediate impact to people. He concluded that fossils were formed together with rocks in which they occur slowly over time in most cases. He didn't say every case, but he said most cases. That means rock layers should contain a, chron a chronological uh, storyboard of what was going on back when those animals were alive. Nicholas Steno came up with these three basic laws that we operate from. He uh, started by recognizing that rock layers were in strata. So stratification, what does that mean? These are particles of rock material that settle out from a fluid, sometimes from wind, proportionally to their weight and their size. So they make something that looks like this. These are rock strata of the Grinnell Formation in Glacier National Park. Now these are Precambrian in age, so that's important to note because those Precambrian sediments tell us a, a storyboard about Glacier National Park that it's not the same depositional environment that it is today. It's something completely different back in the Precambrian. Nicholas Steno said that dissolution and precipitation can occur to sedimentary fossils or rocks found in sedimentary rock layers. And so he said that sedimentary materials can be created and they can be destroyed by some type of chemical process, which is very true. We know that to be true today. He also said that rock layers consisting of particles and shells could not be of the same uh, age and have existed from the beginning of time, but must have been made one layer at a time. So if I take this layer of stromatolites in Glacier National Park, I have to look at the context of the rock layer that it's found in. First of all, figure out the age. Uh, based on uh, stratigraphic and radiometric dating that we've already done of the uh, Glacier National Park. And then I can look at this fossil and understand that it's a stromatolite, knowing exactly what type of depositional environment it formed in. So I'm starting to put multiple clues together. Obviously, the stromatolite, stromatolites did not look like this when they were alive. They've been squashed. They've been a little bit metamorphosed. They've undergone uh, pressure from overlying rocks, so they've been deformed. And he was right to say that rocks and fossils can be changed after they've been put in a rock layer. So the three laws that he came up with, the obvious most important one is the law of superposition. 
This principle or law states that in a group of vertical rock layers, like you're seeing here in Sedona, that the bottom layer should be the oldest and the top layer should be the youngest. As you recall in physical, there's always an exception to the rule, but it doesn't happen during deposition. That happens after rock layers are made, they're deposited, they're lithified. Sometimes we can get a thrust fault that can shove uh, older rock layers on top of younger rock layers. How do we know that happens? Typically by fossils. For example, if I find a Cambrian age trilobite sitting on top of a Tyrannosaurus rex rock layer, well, there was a gap of literally over 500 million years between the two, there's something up with that story. So the Cambrian trilobite was certainly laid down 500 plus million years before the T-Rex was ever conceptualized in the rock record. But nevertheless, we find him above T-Rex because of a uh, cross-cutting relationship where a fault shoved an older rock layer on top of a newer one. So remember that superposition means that's the order that the rock was laid down in, maybe not the order that it's in today. He also came up with the law of original horizontality. Original horizontality, I have to kind of break that apart, it means it was originally flat. Sedimentary rock layers typically settle out from fluids or wind in a flat manner and by gravi uh, gravitational influence, and when they do, they're deposited in a flat, systematic manner before any type of deformation occurs. So we're looking at Death Valley here, and can you see the folding that's happened in these rock layers? Well, those are sedimentary rock layers, but they were deformed after they were made. So that was a big uh, observation for Steno to come up with. He also came up with the law of lateral continuity. Continuity means it's continuous. So if you look at Bryce Canyon here, notice that these hoodoos here match these over here. You can see these rock layers match these. This whole system is one similar same rock layer. So rock layers will extend in all directions until they pinch out. In physical, I usually use the example of baking my first cake where I chose a pan that was way too large and put the batter in for just one cake and the batter spread out till it it finally it just finally pinched out and there was still a lot of pan left. That's what pinching out means. But when you're looking at rock layers, sometimes they can be uh, stopped because of a topographic barrier like a mountain. In this case, we got mountains all the way around Bryce Canyon and it's locked in sediments that were in a big basin. They represented an ancient uh, lacustrine environment, which would be a lake environment. So what we will have happen is sometimes rock layers are abruptly stopped in an area for that reason or other times they may completely pinch out far away from the source of where they eroded away. Principles of geology can be well documented in the Grand Canyon. So superposition is well exposed in three-fourths of the canyon walls. The bottom of it is very, very old stuff pre-Cambrian. And then you get flat sedimentary rocks pretty much on top of all that pre-Cambrian uh, sediments. You have a little bit of tilting in one place of the canyon. Nevertheless, they've been undisturbed and they represent horizontal rock layers of literally about 250 million years of time, which makes a really excellent rock record in the Grand Canyon. Since most of the layers are flat and haven't been deformed, the law of original horizontality applies. Uh, these may look like they're slightly bent and they slightly are deformed, but most layers are systematically flat within the Grand Canyon. Lateral continuity applies because the north and south rim, same with the east and the west, all have matching rock layers where the canyon is the same basic formations that extends uh, laterally for over 276 miles. So it's a very, very large set of geologic formations and it gives you a regional perspective of how these principles are applied. So going back to early thoughts about fossils, there's a few other important people that play a role in fossils. First of them is Robert Hooke. He had a few thoughts on how about fossils that would add to Steno's and uh, certainly Da Vinci's work. He said for the organic statement that fossils were truly organic and had not been put in rocks by one single flood event. He also said that studying them under a microscope helped him illustrate fossils, shells, and made him understand that they were different. In other words, there were many different types of shells based on specific 
morphological uh, characteristics that those animals had. He also introduced the usefulness of fossils. He stated that fossils could be used just like our prior guys did, saying it can make a chronological uh, assistance. In other words, help us date rock layers. So he compared that to ancient Roman coins, because back then in that day, people collected coins just like they do now. And ancient coins changed over time, so you could document civilizations based on the coins that they had. So he was saying we could use the same approach for looking back in time at rock layers that are much older than humans to, based on fossils and the types of fossils that are there. He also suggested that there is a fixed lifespan of, of fossils. In other words, these animals had uh, a very finite amount of time they lived on the Earth, and some of them had no living counterparts that were on the planet today, indicating that they are much older and some more primitive forms of animals we might have today. An example might be dinosaurs. Well, that brings us into a very important guy in geologic history, one that we mentioned in physical by the name of William Smith. He gets the nickname William Strata Smith. And the reason he gets that nickname is that he uh, built the first uh, geologic map. So let's, uh, we'll come back to him in just a second. We'll talk about John Woodward. This is an important guy because he showed the correlation between specific rock layers on the mainland of Europe and then tried to correlate those to rocks exposed in Britain, strictly using fossils. So people are beginning to get that fossils have some beneficial use in terms of age dating relatively a rock layer. So the first basic geologic map was produced in 1746 and it showed uh, mainly mineral composition. And why minerals uh, using fossils? Because back then, mining had just become kind of a big deal in terms of trying to find uh, specific mining resources for metals, for precious stones, and so forth. Well, around 1800, William Smith would really produce a uh, age-dated, if you want to call it that, color-coded map. This map would be the standard for geologic maps even today. So this guy was a surveyor and he saw that there was a widespread regularity in rocks and in the rock record and that fossils were unique to each and every rock layer. So he felt it would be important enough to map out sequences of rocks and in other words rock formations and actually show where they were exposed at the surface. So when he put this recognizable geologic map in place around 1800, these maps were used in mines and allowed him to map different rock layers according to their rock and mineral structure as well as definitive fossils, which is essentially what happens in every field course around the world today. Not just field course, but crews for any kind of mining operation or oil and gas exploration. That is what happens even today. So geologic mapping has been going on for hundreds of years and will continue to. So William Strata Smith is so important that you can find a reference to him in any type of natural museum of history dealing with geology. His mapping extended all the way across England and he noticed that most rock layers existed over regional distances, not just a small linear distance. And when he published that first map that became really famous in 1815 of Europe, it uh, had a table of strata and corresponding rocks. Well, that map legend system is still used today. In other words, he used a color-coded system to denote basic uh, groups of fossils and rock types, and later that would be changed to ages. This helped planning for canals, quarries, mines, and soil guides. It became very useful, not just for, for geology, but for economic gain. So his detailed account of each rock layer, meaning each rock strata, helped him predict where rock layers would be found, even though they may not be in, uh, mapped yet in other areas. He hypothesized that the same rock layers are probably regional and we should find them in other places. That, still, that premise is still alive today, and that's why mapping continues to look for similarities between rock layers. This is his actual uh, map that he put together of Europe his, in 1815. He also came up with understanding that like fossil assemblages are going to be uh, about the same age. 
This is the most important geologic principle developed since Steno came up with the three primary ones that we looked at. Steno's principle of superposition was applied to fossils and later then applied to the geologic time scale. He understood, uh, Smith did, that a succession of rock layers with fossils, that the bottom rock layer with the fossils should be much older than the ones that are at the top. Which brings us to something that you've already learned about in physical, which is index fossils. Index fossils are fossils that are very useful in uh, age dating rocks with a relative manner. And here is why. You must meet all three requirements to be an index fossil. This was very important to this course, so obviously test-related stuff. First is the fossil must be easily recognizable, meaning it is distinguished as very common for that time. Number two, widespread in occurrence over a large geographic area. Number three, the fossil must be restricted to a narrow window of geologic time. In other words, its geologic range, it starts here, it ends here, it's very distinguishable what that range is. So that trilobite is an index fossil. I know We know its basic range, and if we find it outside of its range, there's something up with that particular question. Index fossils are extremely useful. They're recognizable around the world. So I was in a, um, a shop getting some opals for my mom in Australia. And these were hanging in the window, and I uh, was what I would have done to have been able to bring it home. <laughs> I asked if I could buy it. They're like, no way. It's so awesome. These were huge. This one was probably about four feet wide, giving you perspective there. That is a recognizable uh, ammonite. And ammonites went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period. Well, they started at a very distinguishable time in geologic past, and they had an end, which makes them a great candidate for index fossils, especially these giant ones like this. So a couple of assumptions are made for index fossils that are important to note here. First is, once a species becomes extinct, meaning it can't reproduce anymore, it never reappears in the rock record. Number two, no two species of fossils will ever be the same. So those are assumptions, kind of like the we operate on principles of geology. They are what they are, right? Like green light means go when you're at a, st at a stoplight. Red means stop. Yellow means hmm. You can make the judge of what that means to you, right? I'm going to tell you there is an exception to the rule. There's something called a Lazarus taxa. Lazarus in the Bible is a, it's a parable that talks about how Jesus brought him back from the dead after he'd been dead for three days. He was a friend of his. And this is a term applied to fossils that are rediscovered alive after we thought they'd gone extinct. There, is a couple, there are a couple of cases of very famous ancient organisms that have been discovered uh, in other parts of the world that we'll kind of address later in this semester. Nevertheless, most of the time it has to deal with the fossil that's thought to have gone recently extinct, and then it reappears somewhere uh, what we totally don't expect to find. So we're assuming that Lazarus taxa situation is a rare circumstance, so put those two assumptions in place and realize that they operate like 99.9% .9 of the time. They're pretty good assumptions for fossils. So there are some other ideas about fossils that are important to put into the scheme of understanding how we got where we are today on fossil understandings. Catastrophism is another uh, theory that puts into perspective how fossils got there. This theory states that there were many catastrophic events, and these catastrophic events uh, caused extinctions of millions of animals simultaneously by some kind of violent change to the environment, to sea level, some kind of uh, episodic major pulse of problematic times. So if this happens, fossils in successfully younger layers were much uh, more like modern organisms, unlike the ones beneath them, which means that they should be very old and extinct. If we've had these extinction events, these old animals would have been eliminated from the gene pool and not able to reproduce, to be refined into species today. So um, there's problems with this theory, obviously. When we look at this, we need to also understand that in the catastrophic thoughts on fossils, that index fossils uh, 
are really not recognized here because this theory shows little or no connection between index fossils and future successive groups of animals and organisms, which we know is not true. So this particular theory I can think can be disproved. I'm going to use this example right here. This is a skull of a saber-toothed uh, cat, and we know that these cats went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. Matter of fact, there is no relationship to modern day animals or modern day big cats. Uh, this is the end of the line for these big cat species right here. They're done. There's no more of them. So you can't say that this animal evolved into some other type of big cat like a cougar. They're not uh, genetically the same. However, we can see other animals that clearly evolved from one succession of life to another. In other words, over time, we can actually see animals evolve. And we'll get to some of those in the Paleozoic and even the Mesozoic and certainly the Cenozoic. So more to come on that as we progress through this semester. Another idea was descent by evolution. This theory states that there is a direct connection among different fossils and successive rock layers. It states that younger organisms were descendants of older organisms and species have changed over time. Somehow that has happened. We can't quite answer the somehow. We can speculate and we can certainly put a pretty good story together based on the clues. But ultimately those storyboards can change. And I'm going to give you an example. Some of you have been to the mammoth site in Waco. If you haven't, I would encourage if you're ever here, you need to do so. It was thought for the longest time that Mammoth Q and Mammoth W were in the same rock layer. There will likely be new evidence produced in writing that's published that proves that Mammoth W, which is the, the haughty mammoth, the lady mammoth, um, is actually in the same layer as the uh, nursery herd. So a long story how we got there, and I will explain it later in this semester because it's important to our Pleistocene uh, discussion of the last ice age. But this is an example of how recent scientific studies have changed what was thought from the get-go at that particular site. So understand that this is an important development in that we change our minds in science based on new data. Scientific method is all about testing a hypothesis and being able to retest it using data to get to the same conclusion or a refined conclusion. In this thought process of descent by evolution, you could say that index fossils uh, do have a connection. So I think that this is more on the right track, maybe not perfectly on the right track, but it's certainly getting there, understanding that it's changed over time. We know so much more about evolutionary change now than we did even 20 years ago with the discovery of genetics. So now that we've looked at the assumptions of index fossils, we've looked at the requirement of index fossils, let's talk a little bit about some more changes among fossils, which is understanding geologic range. This was a big step in paleontology was to understand fossils have a designated range, meaning a start and a finish in the rock record, thus the geologic time scale, based on its total time of existence. For this example, this is an adiosaur from the Triassic. So the very first thing I showed you, this was a plate probably of one of them, or uh, this guy right here probably would have been one of these plates right here, or it was a phytosaur which looked like a big giant crocodile, same kind of armored body. But we know adiosaurs had a very restricted range of the Triassic and even then a specified part of the Triassic because we never find any before rock layers, older rock layers of when it first appears and we never find them after. So that restricts the uh, time of existence. So while an animal may not be an index fossil, it certainly can have a geologic range. So when we find index fossils, such as an adiosaur, so this person's uh, actually digging at our burpee site and they're digging for dinosaur bones using a scribe, and, uh, and they're, they've actually got one right here and they're kind of cleaning away the material, we have to be very careful because we can't just take one fossil out of context. If you do that, the, the context of the fossil loses its... Uh, meaning, because when you take clues and you just take one of them, you're not getting a comprehensive story. You have to look at geology as a set of clues, not just one clue.
So we're going to take a break here and we'll come back and we'll finish up fossils in just a little bit. So I want you to be thinking about how cool it would be to go outside and do this. <laughs> it's pretty awesome, isn't it? So finding fossils is really remarkable because sometimes you find a home run. And we'll talk more about that when you return. See you in a little bit. Bye.